Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you uh, wherever you're from. I know for some people it's not afternoon, it's already evening, and for some of you probably it's still morning. Um, we welcome participants from across Africa, uh, from across Europe, uh, we're expecting people from North and South America and from a few places in, in Asia, um, from Bangladesh, from India. We're not uh, we're very well timed uh, for colleagues uh, uh, from Asia, but we welcome everybody wherever you're from. Uh, this session will be recorded because it's our intention that this uh, webinar and the others in the series should be available, not just to the people uh, who've managed to make it uh, today, but for those who um, are quite reasonably tucked up in bed because it's, it's nighttime now. So a warm welcome to you all. Um, my name is Audrey Osler. I'm Professor of Education at the University of Southeastern Norway. I'm also the um, Editor-in-Chief of Human Rights Education Review, which is one of the uh, bodies which sponsors this seminar series. And uh, so far, all the papers that have been presented in this series have already been published in, in the journal. Um, I'm also with Hugh Starkey, who's going to introduce our speakers shortly. Um, Ed, um, coordinator of the WIRA, the World Education Research Association International Research Network on Human Rights Education. And this event uh, is designed to build this network of human rights educators across the globe and to strengthen it. And that, that's our goal. And that's also the goal of the journal, Human Rights Education Review. So these are the people you're with this afternoon or this evening or this morning. And we're very, very pleased that, that um, so many of you ha have joined us right now. Our activities like this are open to everyone. So many of you, most of you, I think, are researchers. Uh, but some of you are from professional backgrounds um, and some of you are from NGOs and uh, this network is designed also for a dialogue between those of us who are engaged in research and, and who are working uh, very practically with human rights and human rights education. You have to sit quietly for a little while and, and listen but the question but there is a chat line and we invite you to pose questions to our speakers by using the chat line. And we ask you, please don't use the chat line for just general chat. Encourage you if you are wanting to make comments on, on, on this afternoon's event to uh, post them on social media and to join in that way. That way we get our ideas out to a much, much wider group. I'm expecting this, this uh, this seminar to be in many ways um, provocative. And I also think that one of the goals of the uh, seminar is to engage in a dialogue, not just between ourselves now, but between different ideas that might follow. And I'm pretty convinced from what we've prepared with for coming in May, that this session will also be a dialogue, also an engagement with the one to follow. So we invite you to participate by putting questions, by communicating across social media, and generally by, by engaging with each other in that way. And we hope that uh, this experience today will, it, will enable you, encourage you to sign up for the journal, to follow the journal online, and to engage with each other um, through social media as well. I'm going to hand now over to uh, Hugh Starkey, who's the co-coordinator of the uh, WERA IRN on Human Rights Education, and he will introduce uh, the, our speakers today. Thank you. Thanks, Audrey. And it's my great pleasure and privilege to introduce our two speakers. Um, Laura Lundy is uh, a a, a qualified barrister. She's 
also a professor in a school that includes uh, education. And she's well known for her work on education uh, and particularly on, on children's rights. She's the editor, in fact, of the journal, the International Journal of, of Children's Rights. Uh, she was uh, author of, of a paper from 2007, which has uh, got um, a very large number of, of citations and uh, is about student voice. And that paper has generated a model that is known as the Lundy model, um, that even this very day was actually being uh, introduced into a national, uh, national policy for uh, children's rights. So uh, Laura, very much a, a leading figure. Um, Gabriella is, is also uh, um, what we might call an up and coming figure in, in, the, uh, in, in children's rights education. Um, when she wrote the paper, which uh, th this is based on, um, she was actually uh, in, in Mexico, but she's now at uh, Trinity um, University College, Dublin, um, where she's a, a fellow and a assistant professor in, in, in education. Um, the paper that they are uh, talking about, as, as you know, is the role of law and legal knowledge for a transformative human rights education and particularly it addresses violations of children's rights in formal education. Now, hopefully a lot of you have already read this paper um, because it was uh, mentioned in, in the publicity. It's available uh, open access on, on the website, um, but it will be uh, very good to hear uh, Laura and, uh, and, and Gabby talk us through some of the key arguments that they want to make in this paper. So uh, over to you. Um, Laura and or Gabby, uh, who, whoever's starting. Laura, I think. Thank you very much, Hugh, and thank you, Audrey and Gabby and I are both delighted to have this invitation to speak to you today about our paper. We um, see this as an opportunity for discussion rather than us talking at you. We're going to do quite a, a brief presentation. And as Audrey mentioned, the paper in itself is a bit of a provocation. And we want this discussion to be to, to, to further engage in this type of provocation. So I'm Laura Lundy from Queen's University Belfast, and my co-author is, is Gabriella Martinez Sainz, who's now at um, UCD, the School of Education in UCD Dublin. And um, so Gabby, if you move to the next slide, we, we, we thought as a way of um, explaining perhaps how we came to write this paper, we would do something quite personal and we would describe who we are and how we came to be interested in the area of human rights education. So I'm gonna go first and it's not something I normally do, but I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself and then Gabby's gonna tell you a little bit about herself and then we're gonna talk about how we got together. So uh, I live in Belfast in Northern Ireland. Um, I was brought up in the area in Belfast, which is most associated with the conflict and the troubles. It, um, that's on the Falls Road in, in West Belfast. I grew up um, walking streets where there would have been very overt um, symbols of human rights and protest. Um, and I was looking back to some of the images that I knew about, and this was when I came across it made a lot of sense to me. And it's talking about oppression breeding resistance and resistance brings freedom. This type of mural is very, very common in Belfast if you've ever been. And I was thinking about that idea of education and resistance. And I was thinking again about a paper that I read by a good friend of mine, Jeanette Habashi. And she wrote about children in um, Palestine and what jihad meant to them. And for them, jihad meant education. And it actually really resonated with me and my childhood when I read her paper, because in the community in which I grew up, there was this idea that our way forward, if it was going to be peaceful, was education. We had to get educated. And there was a very strong drive in our community that we would be the first generation to be educated and go to university. And, and, and I was thinking again about how I ended up becoming a lawyer. And I think there were very strong signals given to us that you were supposed to be a teacher or you were supposed to be a lawyer or ideally a doctor. Um, and I was given a very strong sense that there was this injustice in our community and there was ways in which that I could resist through education and one of them was law. And so that language of law and human rights was all around my childhood. 
and the ambitions that my parents had for me, and then ultimately the ambition I had for myself, which at that time was to become a lawyer, which I did. And I qualified as a barrister in 1989. And the next image is of me standing, and it will not mean much to many of you, but for anybody who knows the court system in Northern Ireland, this is the day of my call to the bar. And we're at the back door of the court. And we're at the back door of the court instead of at the front door because the, the court had been bombed and completely the front had been obliterated not long before. So we had to be called at the back. So very much arriving and qualifying in that height of still the Northern Ireland conflict. And actually it was interesting even just to look at who I'm beside the woman. I'm the one in the middle of the front row. I don't know if you recognize me with the wig, um, but again, looking at some of the people around me, the woman to my right is, was became the first high court, um, female high court judge in Northern Ireland. But I didn't take that formal practicing route. I quickly took an academic route and I went to the law school in Queen as, Queens as a young lecturer in public law. And again, there I had a lot of interest in people understanding law and I ran a clinical legal education program where I um, won an award for a thing called Law in the Community. I didn't see myself as a human rights educator, but what that program did was it had law students. It was a street law type activity. It had law students going out and working with what we call then young offenders, but young people in conflict with the law and teach them about their rights. And they were really interested in their rights. They were interested in their right in terms of stop and search and in terms of lawyers. I mean, these were the things that mattered to them. I then got interested in education as a legal discipline and I wrote the first text on education law in Northern Ireland. And already I think I was beginning to shift because in the foreword to that book, I said that I had not written this book for lawyers, that I did not want it to be used to sue schools. I thought that was a waste of education resource. And I said, I wrote it in a style that I hoped it would be used by schools and parents so that children would enjoy their rights. Because again, I'm very much seeing law as having a role in delivering the rights that I, I saw that children should have or could have. And then finally, and I'm skipping along a bit here, I'm skipping past the Lundy model that Hugh mentioned, but my recent work, again brings me to work with Gabby and in recent uh, past year two years I have been working on children who are act as human rights defenders and we're going to come back to some of the data on that and again in that work it's become really um, important to me whenever I've been talking to children uh, who act as human rights defenders so the ultimate you think product of human rights education these are children who are in their communities acting for their rights and the rights of others that these children want to know their rights and they want to know law. So that's me, I'm a lawyer, I'm a professor, I'm a researcher. I've been a human rights educator for 32 years, educating adults and then more recently working with children and young people. And I'm gonna pass over to Gabby so that she can introduce herself. Well, I, um, I'm Gabby, I am an educator and for me, a very important part of my identity is that I am not a lawyer. Uh, even though I come from a family where it was the norm rather than the exception, I was very much supposed to be the fourth generation of lawyers in my family. Uh, my granddad, who you can see in the slide, he uh, practiced law all his life and then he lectured in philosophy of law at the National University. My uh, grandmother worked in the, Supreme, in the Mexican Supreme Court all her life. Uh, she was one of the first women uh, of the first generation of women in Mexico that actually was allowed to go into law school. And my dad uh, also worked in the Supreme Court and practiced law all his life. And that was supposed to be the path that was what was expected. And uh, very recently, as recently as last week, uh, jokingly, but not uh, very far from the truth, my father was mentioning how I actually broke the legal legacy of the family by not going into law school. So for me, being not a lawyer was always some sort of pride because I remember from very early on thinking that what I wanted to do was help people, yeah, not in the bad situations, but actually help them throughout the way to become the best version of themselves to uh, overcome barriers. And I couldn't see how that could be uh, achieved in 
kind of in legal studies or practicing the law or teaching the law. However, <laughs> I found out that the law is very much related to education and how we live and how uh, we develop as human beings. And the first time I uh, very hesitantly have to ask again for kind of like legal advice and understand of the legal, big legal concept was when I started uh, writing textbooks in Mexico. And again, my view was how we can make things uh, appealing to secondary, uh, secondary school children, how we can make civics and ethics education something that they actually want to, uh, to study. But I am from Mexico. And the thing is that even when you want to overlook uh, the law and human rights violations and just focus on the education part, you can't do it in a country like, like Mexico. Uh, teacher students disappear, get kidnapped, and uh, no one knows about hundreds and hundreds of teacher students for years to come. You probably recognize the image that's from one of the most uh, recent case of student teachers disappearing. We presume uh, killed. We don't know if it was by the state or by the drug cartels. We just know they are not there anymore. Uh, Mexico is a country where every day an average of 10 girls and women are killed every day. And most of these girls are kidnapped and killed leaving the school or on their way to school. So I tried, I really tried not to go into law and not to think about the law, but in a context like that, it's just basically impossible because you have human rights violations every single day and you have to make sense of those human violations when you want to teach about civics, ethics, even when you have to teach about the right of going to school, it's so interconnected in the, in the reality we're living that you can't simply ignore it. So I, I decided to actually look at how we can teach human rights, uh, considering we are in a context that's not respecting of those rights. And that's how I started uh, researching human rights, even though I promised myself that I was going to be as far as possible from anything related to law, to the very satisfaction of my family. They say that, that now I am here, I'm working with lawyers, which I very much enjoy, but without being a lawyer. And recently, one of the things that I, I also want to now look at, and this, this is something that Laura and I have been working together, is uh, how children and young people are actually occupying the spaces that we, uh, for many years, we only granted for adults. These are spaces of defending and promoting human rights and looking ways in which we can empower children who are already doing it, but also supporting younger generations to keep on having a stellar role in researching, in defending human rights. So that's us. And I think it matters <laughs> on, on many different levels that it's us speaking today about this, Laura? Most of you will have followed the news in, uh, in Belfast or in Mexico, and you'll see that actually we both still come and I still live in a society that is still very deeply affected by division and conflict. And it makes you reflect on the human rights education that's available in our schools with our children. And I know in, in our case that it's often discretionary and it doesn't cover their own rights, which is what our paper is about, so that you have communities who feel very disaffected and of course have a right to protest, but don't necessarily understand the nature of peaceful protest and what that means. And I think it's understood human rights education has to have meaning in our context or it doesn't have meaning anywhere. And I think what Gabby and I are going to look at now is actually just a quick summary of the paper. Gabby, do you want to add to that about Mexico? Uh, no, it's just at the moment where uh, we have non-peaceful protest in Belfast, we are having children who are being effectively recruited by drug cartels and community 
because they have no other thing to do in Mexico since the schools have been closed for over a year now. So let alone the right to education not being respected, there is literally nothing for them to do other than joining the drug cartels. So, so I'm um, sure many of you listening will have your own stories of your own context. There is no context in the world where every child's rights is fully respected, particularly in their education. And I've been maybe thinking about that, but I think both of us came at this and came into our careers with very strong ideas about justice, rights and role of law and education. And then by chance, we met each other <laughs> and we wrote a paper. So Gabby, do you want to introduce our paper? Yes, so we got wrote... a chance, but Gabby engineered me. <laughs> but it, it, it was, we didn't met by chance, but I think this paper, and, and we were just remembering that the other day, this paper just emerged as a conversation, as a dialogue coming from these very two different perspectives, from someone uh, with a legal background working in education and someone with an educational background trying to avoid the law, but nevertheless arriving to the same space of human rights education. And Laura and I, we both share a, a really deep interest on making it work. I think our main goal is how we can make human rights education something that works for children, for practitioners, for, for everyone. That's actually what we call in the paper transformative human rights education. And the main argument of the paper and what we will defend fiercely, I believe, is that for that transformative human rights education to happen, legal knowledge is absolutely necessary. Because without legal knowledge, people can be developing new knowledge, skills, and values that they can use. Sure, they might be grasping uh, underlying principles such as democracy, tolerance, empathy, and so on. But without a very strong legal knowledge as part of that transformative human rights education, we are, we are doing a disservice to the whole human rights education efforts because we are not giving them the proper skills to identify breaches of rights and knowing what they, what they need to do to address those uh, breaches of rights. Because at the end of the day, they have to be able, and we were in, in the paper, we talked specifically about children because we discuss different breaches of rights that happen in schools. So we were talking specifically about children. They have to know how to respond when there are violations of their legally warranty rights. And without legal knowledge, they simply, uh, they don't have the tools to act when these legal commitments are not fulfilled. Nora? Yeah, I'll just speak to the next. I suppose in the paper, we quote Martin Luther King's famous quotation in the context of human rights struggle, where he says, it's not law or education, it's law and education. And I think that very much is, is our opinion and, and what we assert in the paper we see it sometimes presented differently and we're going to come to that but we feel very strongly this is it's not law instead of education but there's a role for law in education and I, and I was really struck by this um, dispute in in England uh, last week or the week before and I, and I really it was a quotation from one of the young women who was involved in a protest about her school and changes to policies and particularly into dress codes. And the children uh, and young people then protested peacefully outside the school. And you can see them, I mean, they're calling the irony of it because they had the knowledge to call the irony of it. They knew they had a right to peaceful protest. And you can hear them talking about that in various interviews. I mean, that's legal knowledge. And they were then calling the hypocrisy of the school of saying, blocking their protests and saying, this is a democracy and we've agreed these rules, even though the rules were unacceptable and they felt racist and they were right and they brought about change. So I was struck by that. So our big point is it's not law or education, it's law and education. So Gabby, yeah. Yeah, so we're going to uh, briefly discuss the things that we didn't say and are really, really important. And is this uh, label that it's oftenly associated when you talk about legal knowledge in human rights education as something that is legalistic. And we have, uh, we have engaged with the different uh, papers that actually 
provide this label when we talk about uh, legal instruments, laws, conventions, and so on, as something that is legalistic. And it's not only that they go for the actual definition of excessive adherence to the law, but it's often used to uh, propose a human rights education that it's uncritical or apolitical or very much about bureaucracy of how to implement conventions in the curriculum, how to in, uh, incorporate uh, legal, mecha legal mechanisms such as the conventions into the education system and so on. And the thing is that we, we didn't say <laughs> that this is absolutely wrong. And it's reducing very much the power and the significance of the legal knowledge within human rights education when we do that. So we're not doing just a disservice as to, to, to the discipline of human rights education. We are, uh, we are not recognizing what being incorporating legal aspects brings, uh, brings about. I don't know if you want to say something yeah, I suppose as a lawyer, when I came to human rights education material, I was really quite shocked by some of the language around law. You know, it seemed to me to be quite pejorative. And I, as a lawyer who'd moved to a school of education, had been really welcome and engaged really respectfully with um, educational discourse. I have never written about human rights education, in fact, without an educator. I was just really struck and it made, it made me wonder why. And I think Gabby and I have started to build uh, a portfolio of literature that uses this term. And we're just curious about it. We're curious. We're looking very much at who's using it, how they're defining it, how, what they're defining as legalism, what they're calling legalism, where they get their evidence base, and sometimes they have no evidence base. Um, and then actually then how they use law themselves, which is interesting, you know, and sometimes, you know, arguably hypocritical. And I think that that's just, it's interesting to us, but we did not want in this paper to engage in a, mud, a mudslinging back, but we want to look at it because we are curious about it. And we're curious, we, we think that um, it's doing human rights education to service. And that's the conversation, the provocative aspect of the conversation we want to have with you. But we're gonna have a couple more slides and then we'll open for questions. So this comes from the, 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 the study that we conducted for the Committee on the Rights of the Child, which informed their UN Committee's um, Day of General Discussion on Children as Human Rights Defenders in 2018. It's just one of the pages from what was an everyone friendly um, report for that event. Uh, and I just wanted to put to you, it seems to me as well, not just that, you know, for those adults to dismiss uh, the knowledge of law and, and simple rights, domestic and international, it actually flies in the face of what children who are human rights defenders say they need, don't get and want. And I think a very powerful case for not dismissing and engaging with law properly are children and young people themselves. And that's often not in the literature that we're, we're actually reading. Okay. And we can see how the idea of legal as something that's uncritical or apolitical or that it's not embedded in the struggles of a particular context actually makes no sense to the way in which children today are they know the law and this phrase it's laura's phrase so i i'll give her absolute credit for this like children today know the law use the law and are changing the law and that's happening whether we like it as adults or not, whether we think it's relevant or not. They are using the law, not only as a platform to kind of amplify the work they're doing, the political work they're doing in the streets, in the communities advocating, but they're using the law to make sure that their rights and their concerns are actually taken, uh, taken into account. So what we're arguing for, I suppose, is that we think that human rights education should be this rich, diverse tapestry of knowledges. I think we have some amazing lawyers in this space, like Alison Struthers' work, and we also have um, an incredibly you know, respected academic lawyer, Professor Suzanne Egan, who's now doing a PhD in this that she doesn't need to do, but she's so interested in human rights education. And I think when we have lawyers, 
um, who are devoting work to it. You know, we want to make this not a cold space for this knowledge. We want to have every discipline in this. I, I think nobody wants an echo chamber, presumably. And I think with Gabby and I, we've been lucky enough to find each other and have honest conversations. And we don't always agree, but we'll always find a way around, well, what is it we're looking at? How do you see that? How do I see that? Is that going to work? And that's where we're at. So we're, I think, inviting you into our fun. But Gabby, Gabby, do you want to say something about the tapestry? Yes, I want to say that uh, as much as we need to, like educators, we need to start being more welcoming clearly with uh, our legal colleagues. We, I think we also need to, to stop being afraid of the law and knowing the law and engaging with the legal, in, uh, the legal documents and actually go and read court documents and uh, legal commentators, uh, commentations uh, about uh, children's rights, uh, schools, and things like that. So we, we also need to make an effort if we're going to create dialogues between these disciplines, between uh, education and the law, we need to have something to discuss about and that can help to, cre uh, to create these spaces. But we have to make an effort. We have to actually also engage in the law with a more open mind and a more benevolent idea of what we can actually contribute together rather than assuming that because it's something we don't know or we don't uh, use the language or we don't many times we don't understand the legal jargon that doesn't mean we should dismiss uh, the benefits of engaging in these conversations so i think now it's just opening the floor so so that's it. That's our provocation. I hope that we did. We, we haven't. We hope that you read the paper. And I suppose we are just curious. What is your take on this? What is the role for law legal in human rights education? Um, is there a role? What is the role? What, what, what's the, why do people not want to engage with it? Why do people want to dismiss it? And what can we do perhaps to help that? And I think for Gabby and I particularly, how can we involve children and young people in that more? Because I think that's where our own work is at at the minute. So thank you very much for attending and thank you for your patience and we look forward to your questions. Okay. Thank you, um, Laura. Thank you, Gabby, for a very stimulating talk. And it, it's lovely to have the, the personal touch, the, the biography. Uh, we're not able to actually uh, meet physically and, and, and have a drink together. So it, it's really nice to have that um, affective uh, element in, in a, a, a seminar. Um, that, that, that's, that's very helpful. We're getting um, questions. So uh, I think what, what you um, were proposing is that um, you, you're challenging the way in which some uh, writers on human rights education have been dismissing uh, certain pedagogical approaches as simply declarationist, um, which for them means that you teach about human rights, but without actually uh, enabling uh, young people to implement the, the human rights to, to themselves become human rights defenders. And we can see that what uh, you and, and, and Gabby are about is actually uh, um, nurturing human rights defenders. Um, so let's go to the questions. We've got, got them uh, straight away. The first one is from um, Helen from Canada. Uh, Helen, if you are available and you can uh, unmute yourself and put your camera on, you can actually ask your question yourself. Would you like to do that? Uh, yes, I just can't uh, put my camera on at the moment, if that's okay. okay. Don't worry about uh, the camera, just, just ask the question, that would be great. We can see you. Um, so, uh, yes, so like I said, my name is Helen from Canada and I was wondering uh, what are some salient examples of children using the law uh, for their human rights uh, based from your collective experiences? Thank you. Do you want to go first, Debbie? We haven't, we haven't got pink and green dots for this. <laughs> now, well, one of, for me, one of the key examples is uh, these two new legal uh, challenges that have been brought to very different uh, uh, institutions. So the first one is the the OPIC complaint uh, to the United Nations Committee of the Rights of the Child by the Consortium of Climate Child 
climate change activists. And a similar lawsuit was brought by uh, other group of children to the European court. And that one has had a green light to actually move ahead and keep uh, like progress in the court. That's at the kind of like the big space of the law. But we, ha we have uh, data from, from very concrete experiences of for example, children having to uh, access the law and reading the law and trying to understand the law when they're organizing Fridays for Future protest in their community. So they know what they can do, what they need, when they need to stop like certain uh, practices from the group because they are engaging in illegal situations and things like that. So uh, peaceful protest and climate change activism, I think it's one of the spaces where we can see the uh, children using very effectively the law, not only as legal mechanisms with these court uh, yeah. proposals, but also as political tools. Yeah, I agree with Gabby. And, and I mean, in the paper, Helen, we set out a couple of cases and, 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 and where children have used the courts, often citing non-discrimination because those are the cases that are often successful. Like we opened with a case from South Africa where children argued that the very poor textbooks they were given in rural communities were not adequate and they were being discriminated against and they were successful. And we make the point that someone, you know, with them had to work with them to understand that this wasn't just unfair, this was unlawful and this breached their human rights and the court agreed with them. But we, we're not arguing that everything should go to court, you know, and, and I think that's what Gabby's saying as well, is actually knowing the limits of protest, knowing when you can protest, knowing when you can access information, it's all those other rights. And, and sometimes I think there's, it gets befuddled between domestic law and international human rights law. And I think often that those things are, are confused a little bit. And what children often want actually is domestic law. You know, and I, I think I see Don Watkins there. And we, we have people like her doing really great projects to make sure that children can access their, their domestic legal knowledge, because that's what they want first, not necessarily the principles. But I will defend the, the kind of work which I've seen criticized in the human rights education material, where an educator in a, per, in a resource poor country does their best to go in front of children and say, these are your rights under this convention. And that's all they can do. That's all they know. That's all they're trained for. I would rather that educator did that than did nothing, you know? And I would still call it human rights education, whereas I see that very dismissed by outsiders. So I think, again, I'm trying to provoke you here, but I think it's not ideal. It's not what any of us would want, but it's something. Thank you. Um, the next question is, is from Hedy, who, is uh, a lawyer. Hadi, would you like to unmute yourself and put your question? Yeah, I don't, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm a legal scholar, maybe. Oh, but uh, <laughs> uh, I've experienced that sometimes when I, when I talk, for instance, I had a talk once about the difference between natural law and, and, and legal positivism and, and the dilemmas that that posed. Uh, but uh, sometimes people come and say, ah, but you have, you have a legal perspective. And and I and as opposed to our perspective, but all perspectives are equally important uh, and valid. Uh, and I'm like, is there such a thing as a legal perspective? Uh, and and I'm like, okay, well, what about legal obligations? Are they just optional, or or I don't know. How do you respond to that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, um, Gabby. Do you want to respond to that, or shall I? I I will wait for you to do the first uh, response because mine will be from a very non-legal perspective. <laughs> I think what, what, what it, it suggested to me is I think another kind of blurring and that is when people say human rights and distinguishing between human rights as moral philosophy and human rights law. And I think, you know, I know that you work in the human rights moral philosophy area. And I think that's so significant for understanding the un underpinning notions of human rights. But I suppose where we're positioning ourselves is in that legal dimension, not exclusively, just because we think it had been not just neglected, but in some ways pilloried. <laughs> and I think that's why we're trying to say, actually, there is a real, there's, a, there's room for this and we can do better here. Not, and, and not, I mean, we're not smearing the whole human rights education community because lots of people are talking about it and using it, but there is a flavor that it, we think is, is um, well, problematic, but thanks. Gabby? 
I, I do have to say that I prefer when the idea of legal perspective is used rather than legalistic approach, which is what we find over and over and over again. Because the idea of legal perspective at least acknowledges that we need to look at this from uh, something other than public policy or um, civic engagement or like we have to take into account that human rights, whether we like it or not, they might be underpinned by very uh, important values and they might be related to democracy and peaceful building and they might be connected to very, uh, very important things that need to be discussed, but human rights are also legal entities. And we have to we have to acknowledge that, and we have to make the case for that. So when we at least acknowledge that there's a legal perspective when we're trying to think how we teach and learn about these rights, at least we are, I think, in the, the first thing, the right direction of saying there's also a legal component that we have to accept and make sense of. Thank you, Gabby. Um, next one up is is Michael. Can you unmute Michael and? Uh... Start your question. Yeah, yeah sure thing. I, I think I just wanted to say that I think this is really important work, but in my last couple of years, sitting on a public legal education committee for the government, I've been very frustrated by them not even thinking about quite a lot of the pedagogical principles that are being discussed here. I see a real lack of imagination from them. They think about this sort of thing, teaching young people about their rights as a as a, as an instrumental thing to achieve policy goals, like reducing the number of legal problems that go to courts and public funding for legal cases. And as someone who finds himself sitting in both camps, both education and law, I suppose my question is: How, how do we how do we convert the skeptics who think in quite a neoliberal way? about what legal education is for, that it can serve wider goals and be about political participation and living with others and encouraging activism rather than simply deterring legal cases. Michael, I think both Gabby and I are completely slinging from the same song sheet as you. I mean, this is how, how we come at it is actually is, is that idea of enabling young people to participate, to take part, to claim rights, defend rights. And it's about democratic space and their ability to engage in democratic space. And the guide that I showed up on my fourth picture of my, um, uh, my, my story is actually a guide I've written for the UN with the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. And crucially, this is a declaration which we don't see in human rights education, the Declaration on Human Rights Defenders, you know, which applies to children as well, but no one thinks of children as human rights defenders. And when we have shrinking democratic space, and challenges, you know, the more education that we can get that shows children what they are able to do. And actually which challenges, and I can see a comment from Dawn, I think will answer this question as well, is in that paper, globally, not just in the UK or Ireland, there is a concern about minimum age requirements in law that do not allow children to, you know, participate in certain things, to form associations, to take actions for redress, you know, to get legal assistance. And those are the kinds of things that actually do make a difference and children want, you know, and I think I, I think I met you before and you gave me a really good guide that you'd written. And I, and I think that kind of work is incredibly important and doesn't get enough attention. And I think in, you know, teachers need this. And I know that you do lots of work and that's, so I'm not gonna say much more about that, but I think that we need to give teachers and others, not just teachers, the confidence to use this. Okay. Thanks. Um, next up is David Lundy. Uh, would you like to just make your point? Um, yeah, I was just wondering um, where this uh, argument for human rights education, human rights legal education, whether it's really a, an argument for legal education more broadly, um, because perhaps one of the problems might be that teachers um, or you know, the curriculum law doesn't really have a place in the curriculum, certainly in UK schools and in many countries, um, politics or philosophy might be uh, a way of approaching this. And certainly as someone who um, works for more of a philosophical um, background, I think we have a tendency in, in my discipline to kind of um, quickly kind of discount the 
the, the, the letter of the law um, and try and get behind it, try and get to the, um, the principles behind it and some of those arguments which are interesting but uh, from a philosophical perspective, but don't actually help the children to understand what the law is um, and the process by which that might change. And I think there the may be similar kinds of disciplinary framings where if you're a historian, you see this in terms of legislative history, and legisl legislative development. Um, if you're a, a sociologist, you see it a different way, but very few teachers have the experience that you have of actually being um, a lawyer, of having studied the law and understanding the law in its own terms. Um, certainly in the UK, there's even uh, a tendency to uh, discourage students who are interested in going into law from studying a level law because they say it's not uh, it's not one of the rigorous subjects it's not one of the the, the facilitating subjects so um, I suppose the, the question that I have is is this an argument for law education on the curriculum or is it something more cross-curricular I think Gabby will want to talk about legal, legal literacy will you Yes, I, I do think there's there's a role of what we in the paper call legal literacy as, a, as such, to have this better grasp of what is the law, how we as citizens can actually have a role in how laws are in, uh, designed, delivered, implemented, and so on. I will just want to perhaps make a distinction that I think it's quite relevant on why I think it's important to make the case of human rights legal knowledge in a separate way, because uh, for what I know, and this is, it's a, this applies to a very significant portion of countries and curriculums in Latin America, for example, there's a huge space to discuss the law in civics and ethics education, huge, but it's always the legal responsibilities you have as a citizen the legal institutions and the, the laws that you have to make sure that you're abiding when you're an adult. So I think those spaces are already there. But what we don't have in the curriculum, for example, as space are uh, opportunities for teaching how to actually use the law when your rights are not protected. So I think even though we argue for legal literacy and, and in a broader sense, I think it's very important to also make the case that human that legal knowledge, when we talk about human rights education, gives you the actual tools to protect you against against uh, the shortcomings of the states, and and that's it. And that's not covered uh, in the curriculum. No wonder why. And it's very unlikely to be covered in textbooks and um, by teachers any other way. Thanks, Gabby. Um, Dawn has got a question that really follows on very closely with that. Dawn, uh, Dawn Watkins, are you around? Hello. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yep, we can. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, thank you. So yeah, my question does follow on from that really. And um, it's around this issue of legal standing for children and enforceability. And, and picking up on Laura, what you said about domestic law and, and the fact that, of course, you know, the UNCLC is not incorporated into domestic law in many, many jurisdictions and how we deal with that. So, you know, I'm coming from a position of legal capability uh, and I'm just also linking back with what Michael said earlier. And I think Michael was at the same all party parliamentary group for uh, that I was at once and, and the question was raised, not by me actually, but in that context, somebody said, what we need to know is what a legally capable child looks like. And everyone laughed. <laughs> and, and I'm still not over the fact that everyone laughed. Um, so in that context, everyone laughed. That was a PLE meeting. So a uh, public legal education meeting, I should say. So it's a bit of a gar garbled question, but it, it's kind of like how do we, it's almost like the ethics, the responsibility of being honest to children yeah. about what their legal rights really are. Yeah. And, and also the flip side of that is with legal capability scholars, they say don't, there's no point teaching children about their rights because they don't actually have any from a, from a strict legal point of view, they don't. Now my view is that 
that these are that they absolutely need to know their rights, but they also need to know that they can't enforce them. Do they? Do you see what I'm saying? But sometimes they can enforce them, Donna, as you know, yeah, and in yeah. the circumstances they have their own right of redress. And I think you make that point in the paper that, you know, you, you, do you really have a right if you don't have a means of redress? Yeah. And I, we often deny children redress, and that's what I think you're getting at. Yeah. And I think if they don't know what they're supposed to have, which is maybe the human rights principles, and they don't know what they actually have, the very limited rights they do, or the denial of those rights, they can't bring about change. And yeah. I think in the human rights defender work, and the guide that we've written for the UN, that's what we're saying. We're giving children the, the knowledge to, to be part of the argument for change in that. So mm -hmm. they are more legally capable. And the idea that people would laugh at the notion that they, is just, you know, again, offensive, but you know, yeah. Thanks, Laura. Mm -hmm. I would like to get in as, as many contributions as possible. Uh, Susanna Egan was uh, mentioned uh, by Laura and you've got a few points that you want to add, I think. Suzanne? Yeah. All right. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. Actually, a couple of the points that I was going to make have already been made. But um, yeah, I, I, I agreed with, with David and, and the point that we made that I think a, a large problem around this is the fact that law itself is not taught in any to any great extent in schools in the first place. And so um, the capacity for people to engage, I suppose, with legal knowledge then um, either in school or out after school is, is already hindered, if you like. And I suppose one of the points, I, I love the idea of the tapestry of knowledges. I, I suppose when I read some of the critiques around um, uh, the declarationist approach, I'm often struck that really that it is um, another element of the argument that um, the global human rights framework is really being criticized because it is in effect Eurocentric and that it, it suppresses other interpretations of rights. And I think that's the, the main argument that we find when we see critiques of the declarationist um, yeah. approach. But really, um, law has an awful lot to offer in terms of interpretation of rights. Um, and when people do engage, as Gabby says, with legal texts and the interpretations of independent um, uh, people who, have, who, who have, are enmeshed in interpreting these texts, these can often be very helpful for a wider consideration of what are human rights. And that's the sort of thing I'd love to see children um, being exposed to a little bit more in schools. And from that, then, they're also getting a grasp of law generally. So. Thanks, Suzanne. Let, let's uh, move now to uh, Ali, uh, who also has uh, a question in a slightly different aspect around child protection. Ali? Yeah, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, hi, thank you so much for that really interesting talk. Uh, it was brilliant. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think your paper was really the jumping off point for me for the work that I'm doing now, which is looking at the role of of law almost in, in in child protection and safeguarding children in schools on the basis that the, the existing system of safeguarding in in this country very much relies on passivity and rea you know, reactivity like teachers noticing when when things are wrong with with pupils and to me the the idea of equipping both both teachers and and their pupils with the ability to understand the rights that these children should be having at home to be protected from harm and abuse to have you know on the neglect front to have adequate food water shelter etc why shouldn't they understand that that they have those rights and that they have they're empowered that they have the right to speak up about those rights rather than relying on somebody noticing that, that something's not not right with them and so, so it sort of made me think how integral it is to include law and legal knowledge and empowerment as part of, of safeguarding the country, which it just doesn't seem to be at the moment. So I just wondered if that was something you considered when you were writing the paper at all, uh, that, that element of, of child protection. Can I ask you to, to wait for a moment and let's have um, what I think is the, is the last uh, question or, or contribution, uh, and then we can give you a chance, both a chance to, to wrap up. But Stephen has a, a, a slightly different point about Scotland. Stephen? 
Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'll be quick then if you're trying to wrap stuff up. Um, basically just um, to what extent do you see the incorporation of the UNCRC into Scots law as um, kind of further making the case for the compulsory inclusion of legal literacy or you know, human rights education, specifically on the domestic aspects now, sort of, you know, it strikes me as sort of necessary to any basic sort of civic education in Scotland that, that it is included because of the incorporation particularly. And uh, thanks for the talk, it was really enjoyable. Thanks, uh, Stephen. Um, okay, final comments from Laura, from Gabby. I, I will take the... <laughs> The, the one from Ali, Lauren, you can talk about Scotland because I know you love that case. Uh, <laughs> I, I think we barely touch on, on the idea that what it implies and, and the assumption that when you bring legal knowledge to schools, very much the, what everyone is afraid is that you're disrupting the whole system. And we didn't explore, and if I remember it correctly, I, I don't think we developed that argument. And I think there's a, there's a lot of, of literature on this idea of bringing human rights, especially if, if you think about those uh, who like very much to teach human rights in relation and always depending on your responsibilities when they talk about children. And those, all, all those approaches that try to pair them like rights and responsibilities and teaching them together. Uh, the view is that you don't want to disrupt things too much. And do you, do, it almost seems like the argument is that you don't want to empower people too much. Like you want them to give them knowledge, but not too much. And you want them to feel uh, that they have rights, but not too much. So even, I don't think we touch very much on that. It's, we mentioned on, we just mentioned how disruptive this can be, like this legal literacy can be for schools, teachers and students. Laura on Scotland. Yeah. Well, I would like to say something briefly to Ali as well, because it's an area I've done some work on, but I think Ali, it's a great place for you to be and to take this work forward. I don't think there's enough, so I encourage you in that. I would say to you that, um, for instance, the UK recently ratified the Lanzarote Convention on Sexual Abuse and Sexual Exploitation, my work, which I didn't really mention that I do as a kind of hobby because I love it, is I spend a lot of time producing child rights, um, child friendly versions of legal documents. And I worked with the Council of Europe and young people to produce a child friendly version of the Lanzarote Convention, which told children their rights in terms of child protection. I can send you references and I feel strongly about it. Scottish point, yes, of course I love Scotland and I've done a lot of work in Scotland and I'm so excited about incorporation until the legal case. And even that, what the learning experience and that legal case taken to, to, to chat, I mean, that, I mean that in itself as, a, as an education tool about the nature of our human rights obligations. But I think the point you're making, Michael, and I really agree with, is in some of that work I've done in child producing child-friendly material, for example, with UNICEF to produce the official child-friendly versions of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, you go anywhere with the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and there's now in the legis Scottish legislation a requirement to teach it. You go out to a school and you tell children their rights, they'll ask, well, what can I do? And you've immediately got the implementation gap between what the convention, the rights of the child says they should have and what as Dawn said, the actual domestic legal reality is. And you need to know both. So I think Scotland would be wise to tackle both because children will demand it and they always do. That's my experience. That's a fantastically challenging uh, note on, on which to end. And uh, it, um, it just remains for me to remind you that we've got um, the next uh, seminar coming up on the 12th of May uh, with Anne Becker and Cornelia Rue from Stellenbosch University in South Africa. They're talking about decolonial human rights education, changing the terms and content of conversations on human rights. Now, we started to mention um, decolonial approaches in, in this seminar, and, and I think that the next one will, will, will be excellent. Um, you are, of course, invited to follow um, the uh, se seminars uh, through Human Rights Education Review, HRER. Um, you can join their, their Twitter feed. Um, and you're also encouraged to register 
on the website of the journal uh, HRER, Human Rights Education Review, um, in which case you, you will actually receive notifications of all uh, upcoming events and, uh, and so on. So it just remains for me to thank Laura and Gavi for a terrifically stimulating uh, and uh, hugely uh, well-informed uh, contribution to human rights education. You've got us all thinking. Um, thank you all uh, for coming and for your questions uh, and uh, uh, for uh, stimulating this, this dialogue between us. I really feel that uh, we're, we're making uh, remarkable progress in this time of, of pandemic when we can't meet, but actually in these rather short periods, we're actually engaging with each other uh, to extent that perhaps we, we really failed to do um, before. So you're all very well, warmly welcome to uh, the next event on, on the 12th of May. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, keep well, uh, get vaccinated and um, uh, defend human rights. Thank you all. Okay, bye for now. <laughs>